words problem solved were used by our client uh, when he described the data and, and what the data will help them achieve. So I quoted him, um, and his name is Aaron Smith, uh, with Formation Environmental. This was a partnership project between Juniper Unmanned, Formation Environmental, and Yellowscan. All three were important. Before we begin, please uh, come fly with me, and we're going to visit the Salton Sea. Here we are on the Earth's surface, and there we go. Across the pond, there's Donald Trump. And here we are in Westmoreland, California. Um, let me, you see, notice uh, all of the agricultural uh, area this is, how intensely agricultural this is. I was, I flew, um, I flew F-18s and A-4 uh, Skyhawks in this area in the 19, late 1980s. And one of the problems that we had uh, in operating was visibility. The wind would come up and it, it had dust and we would have to shoot instrument meteorological condition approaches because of the dust. Um, and then you get out of the airplane and you would breathe that dust and my lungs are quite sensitive and my lungs would tell me this is not good. So this is the research that I did, person oops, that I did personally um, in the 1980s. So um, I'm going to back up and give you an idea of where we are uh, in California. This is called the Imperial Valley and the Salton Sea is right here. Um, this is the Colorado River over here. Okay, so to give you a better idea, here's the beautiful metropolis of Los Angeles up here, and here's San Diego. So that's where we were on the Earth's surface. Um, before I tried to come across to you uh, that this was an absolutely perfect uh, execution, let me be completely honest. Anything in the field is dirty and chaotic, and you, I, I hope you will find my presentation uh, chaotic, but makes sense. <laughs> then we went out in February of this year, and that's what I'm calling day zero. Day zero because nothing happened that day. We got stuck in the mud. Um, in the middle, that's Aaron Smith in the middle over here. And he and I uh, worked for two hours um, and, and built a dike around the vehicle. And then uh, there, that, that's what I looked like when I was done. Um, and I must add that while I was doing this, this is, this is pure poetry. While we were doing this, the Blue Angels, which fly F-18s, they were practicing. So I'm digging in the mud watching, watching uh, those aircraft fly over my head. It was, uh, it was a, it, it actually, it was fun once it was over. This is my presentation. You can see it's chaotic. This is the way life is in the field for operations. And that's what I want to focus on. I, I want to reach out to my fellow operators who go out in the field and try and capture reality. Okay, over here we have T.S. Eliot, and I'm going to begin with T.S. Eliot. This is a poem. Poetry tries to capture reality too, in a different way. I'll let you read this. Um, I, by chance, chose this because of the river concept here. Um, but then I noticed that the problem once solved were the words that are in there. And uh, so it became more attractive to me. Uh, and that was just today. Then I noticed the problem once solved. Uh, how the Salton Sea became a sea in modern times was um, people were trying to harness the Colorado River, and they built a dike and they thought they were doing the right thing, but the strong brown god breached the dike and created this huge lake. It leaked into Southern California for two years before they were able to stop the flow of water. And before it had been completely desert. You saw in the Google Earth image of where those agricultural fields were, and then just a little bit to the west, you've got absolute complete desert that looks like Afghanistan. Um, so it was a mistake. Uh, it created a sea, and as Americans do, they acted like they intended to do it, and um, they created a resort area out of it, and then it got heavily salted and got agriculturally uh, 
polluted with chemicals, and, and so it's a problem. Now they are letting the sea dry up. They're not allowing any more water in t into the Salton Sea, and so as the water recedes, you have what they call playa. This playa, uh, sand grains fly across the valley, ping on the surface, just a little sand grain, ruptures the surface, and the wind lifts the dust, and that's the source of dust. Um, along comes an environmental engineer and says, well, let's alter the surface of the earth and create a windbreak. And so that's what's up to, that's what we're doing right now. And they have to monitor that serrated surface, and I'll show you more later, uh, so that it doesn't, so it keeps the wind from lifting the dust. So let's move to, uh, this is uh, a picture from above. And let me show you a picture of what it looks like uh, right next to these uh, rows of tillage. So this is what the earth actually looks like there. Um, so before, the Formation Environmental was using photogrammetry. And um, they were having problems getting the accuracy that they required. And you can see why. The contrast of sand is quite difficult. If you look at this, you can see, as you focus in on the uh, DSMs, it's very difficult to tell what sand is higher than the other as you get closer and closer. So these are just screenshots. Um, but that was the problem that they came to uh, Pierre and Tristan and myself with at uh, the International LiDAR Mapping Forum in 2016. Yes, that, that's when it was, 2016. So that lack of contrast made them say, um, what's up with LiDAR? Uh, um, that's kind of an English slang thing. Uh, the proper way to say it is, what's up with LiDAR? Um, the gangsta way is, what's up with LiDAR? <laughs> and that's not what T.S. Eliot would have said. Um, this is what a profile view of the tillage looks like. And here are the proper naming. These are the technical names for it. You have a total depth of one, uh, about one meter, and so you have a, uh, a ridge, and it has height. You have spacing between the ridges. You have spacing uh, within the furrow, and then you have spacing between the rows. So it's extremely important to be able to measure accurately down here at the bottom of the furrow and up here at the top of the ridge. That's what creates the windbreak. It's that serrated surface that slows the wind down. In addition to the, um, this, I must mention that they're planting iodine plants that control the erosion as well. So this is a man-made solution, but they're also using vegetation to uh, slow down the wind. And that uh, is, is, has been a successful mix. So the purpose of this was to compare photogrammetry with LiDAR. Uh, they flew, they wanted to fly their Phantom 4. It's a 12 megapixel camera. It's what they had been using before that they had, getting, got, uh, that they had gotten that Agisoft result with, and that's what they were using. Um, this is a picture that was taken, uh, I won't say at sunset or sunrise, I'm just going to say that um, because in the United States it's illegal to fly uh, after dark, um, <laughs> but it's not dark yet. <laughs> uh, it's also a beautiful picture. Um, and over here you can see Aaron Smith out in the middle of the field using a normal RTK with a base station and he was measuring points and I'll show you exactly what that looked like from a God's eye perspective. But this is ground truth. This is what they used to do uh, before uh, getting out there with the UAV. And you know, as you can tell, you can't, they have hundreds and hundreds of hectares that they have to manage. So you can't do this all over the place. So they're looking for a low-cost, uh, capable solution that can do this. When we uh, consider the area that we looked at, this is the southwest portion of the lake. And so this actually, this whole area, is um, what we uh, actually flew and delivered the data for. But this test area is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and get closer like this, it's that pink area, and, and it's a, it was about 100 meters long by about 80 meters wide or so. And uh, just as a quick slide, um, to give you an idea of 
This is what we do to analyze the day. You have operational time, turnaround time, and then the total on-site time. This is our battery usage. We use a uh, Matrice 600 Pro with the surveyor uh, as, as the payload. Um, and it, and it's, it's working out very well for us. You can, and this is a sample of the times, like we took off at 8, landed at 8.07, turnaround time was 20. As we got further through the day and towards the end of the day, our turnaround times were at six minutes, uh, five minutes even. And that's possible because of the DJI Matrice 600 and the way you manage the batteries out in the field. If they're not flying, they're charging. If they're not charging, they're ready to fly. And that's how you have to approach uh, the battery usage. This was the test area. We were off to the west of it. We would take off, and this was the general pattern that we flew over the test area. In the test, we flew at 40 meters, we flew at 15 meters, and we flew at five meters. And you can see uh, what the parameters were there. This, is, uh, this shows you all of the points that were taken with the rover, with the handheld, with the rod. And, and <laughs> I did, I, um, up here, uh, I, I got the privilege of doing some about this much of these points on the first day when the mosquitoes were out. And, and after the sun goes down, the mosquitoes just swarm, and I was getting bit right and left. And I was mad at Aaron because I had gloves on. I, I like to work in the field with gloves. And he said, why are you wearing gloves? And <laughs> um, as if I was a sissy because I was wearing gloves. And uh, so I took the gloves off, and then the mosquitoes rolled in on me. <laughs> This is the primary result that I'd like to share with you guys. Um, the black is the actual measurement that was taken by the tachyometry, the uh, um, <coughs> rover um, with the RTK. And so those were considered ground truth. That is the measurement that we're trying to achieve. The 15 millimeter LIDAR, uh, 15 meter, sorry, not millimeter, 15 meter LIDAR uh, flight is in the green. And you can see how closely the green line follows the black line. So it's reflecting reality in the best way, capturing reality. And so we determined that the 15 meter LIDAR elevation really was the best bet. The five meter gave incremental marginal improvements, but it was so slow and it, it would take so long to get anything done that you really didn't gain anything by flying at five meters. Um, I guess something that was interesting from the five meter fly is we took a four inch cookie and in that four inch cookie we had 77 chocolate chips, meaning we had 77 points of light that were returns that we measured and looked at in comparison with some of the tachyometry that was taken and uh, the client suggested that we were as accurate with the LIDAR as they could have been with the survey stick. So um, you can see the next line, the, the um, magenta line, is the 40-foot photogrammetry. And you can see it just rounds out the tops and bottoms. And with, with that kind of imprecision, they can't make good decisions as to how they manage, um, manage the tillage and go out and refresh the tillage. So uh, here's, here's uh, the point cloud as it came out, um, just raw, basically. Um, here's a colorized point cloud of what it looked like. Um, here's another picture of the colorized point cloud, and you can compare that to the actual picture and, um, and see that the colorized point cloud with the LiDAR delivers the product that the client needs. Let me move to here and show you the, the spread of data um, that, that correlates with that graph that I showed you a little bit ago. Let's go to the 40 foot. So this is an example of the data that we pulled from uh, the RTK, or, uh, the RGB in relation to the RTK. And you can see the deviations, the standard deviations in the boxes um, and, and their difference from what the RTK measurement was. You're, you're getting, uh, on the ground control points, you had 12.5 uh, centimeters of difference. So it's not bad, but not good enough for what they would like. Um, at the bottoms of the ridges, uh, you had about uh, two and a half, three, two and a half inches of difference. Uh, the tops of the ridges, um, you had 
20 centimeters of uh, error. And um, this, is, uh, this is why they wanted to improve their data set. So when we, unless anybody's very interested in other ones, uh, let's take a look at the 15 meter fly. And this is the kind of data spread that we saw at the 15 meter um, data acquisition level. You're seeing, uh, I think, less than one centimeter on the ground control points, perhaps one centimeter on the bottoms, uh, less than one centimeter on the ridge tops. Um, and then these are the photo GCPs that were uh, out there in the test area. And in relation to the transects, that's how close uh, the accuracy was. So I will end with poetry. In my beginning is my end. In succession, houses rise and fall, crumble, are extended, are removed, destroyed, restored, or in their place is an open field, or a factory, or a bypass. And T.S. Eliot talks to me about LIDAR because we use LIDAR for construction and healing of the earth. And that's, uh, that's what I see LIDAR as the ultimate tool, is we can have a better relationship with the earth and help heal what we have done to the earth in our industrial age. Fini, merci.